Hi everyone, in this video we are going to cover section 3.6, uh, the chain rule. Before we get to the formal statement of the chain rule, uh, give you kind of a visual, maybe a little bit more intuitive um, sense of why the chain rule makes sense. And in this um, in this example, we're going to be looking at these three people. I love this clip art that I added in here. Um, we've got Sue, we've got a baker, and we've got John. These are just people that I picked that were built into my app that I used to record. Um, and let's say for no good reason, they're all running a race, okay? And I know that the baker, the baker is twice as fast as John. John is slow. So the baker finishes the race twice as fast as John. And I also know that Sue is three times, Sue's really fast, times as fast as the baker. So the, compared to John, right, he's real slow. Sue is three times as fast as the baker. The baker is twice as fast as John, okay? So we want to talk about rates of change, right? Here we can express these um, these rates twice as fast, three times as fast, using the uh, the calculus notation that I've kind of thrown in bits and pieces here and there. Okay, so I'm going to write this down, and it may be a little bit confusing, but uh, it'll I'll bring it to a conclusion in just a minute. All right, so the rate of change, so d capital B over d j, that that notation that I've written there is the rate of change of the baker with respect to John. The baker's rate of change with respect to John is 2. He is twice as fast as John. Okay, I'm going to write something similar for Sue, for the second sentence that I wrote. The rate of change of Sue with respect to the baker is 3. Her rate of change with respect to the baker is 3. She's 3 times as fast as the baker. All right. We put those two pieces together. This is where the chain rule comes from. If I wanted to know the rate of change of Sue with respect to John, how much faster is Sue than John, right? That would be Sue's rate of change with respect to the baker times the baker's rate of change with respect to John, right? And before I did all this fancy calculus notation, you may have already known that to compare Sue to John, you do three times two and you get six. She is six times faster than John. You didn't need calculus to know that, but we can, um, we can introduce this formal notation and that's why intuitively, the where, where intuitively the chain rule comes from, all right? And so now I'm gonna slide this slide up and give you the formal notation for the chain rule. All right, and this at the bottom here is what I have um, what I just did, but with X's and, and Y's. This is how you will more typically see it. Okay, I have F and G are functions for all X in the domain of G on which G is differentiable and F is dis differentiable at G of X, meaning has a derivative, the derivative of their composite function. So the chain rule is how we take derivatives of composite functions is given by this formula here or this formula here, depending on which notation we're using. And I would hope that you'll get comfortable with both and I'll show you both. So H prime of X is F prime of g of x, so we're going from f of g of x down to the derivative f prime of g of x times g of x. Okay, and so what we can kind of think of that as is this f prime of g of x, that's the derivative of the outer composite function times g prime of x, that's the derivative of the inner of the composite functions. Composite meaning they're like nested, that's what term I'll use often in this is nested functions. And then using this other notation, it is dy over dx equals dy over du times du over dx. The rate of change of y with respect to x is the rate of change of y with respect to u times the rate of change of u with respect to x. And I, like I said, I'll go through both of those notations, but let's look at a couple examples and see how it works. In OpenStax, they do give uh, a, a more formal proof of, of why the chain rule um, is correct. Again, for the purposes of this video, I don't want to go into that much detail. If you liked the pictures up above, um, that's good enough for me. 
one important use of the chain rule um, is specifically for when we have um, exponents with functions inside or functions raised to a power. So I'm thinking here um, an example will will do something similar to is if I have some expression x squared plus 3x plus 2 raised to the fifth power. That's what is meant by g of x to the n. Okay, and so the derivative of that h prime is n times g to the n minus 1. So that exponent comes down and we subtract 1 from the exponent, but what's in between inside the parentheses that stays the same, but then multiplied at the end by g prime of x, the derivative of the inside. Okay, so that's something that is going to, uh, again, the chain rule allows us to take derivatives of more functions. Okay, and here, um, let's look at an example as I scroll down. We'll do two here. All right, so I have my h of x is this quantity raised to the fourth power. So in this example, the g is that stuff inside the parentheses there. All right, and what the chain rule says is that when I take the derivative, h prime of x, the derivative of the outer nested function is four times the inside to the four minus one is three, but that inside stays the same. 2x cubed plus 2x minus 1. Then, then we multiply by the derivative of the inner function, the g function. So the derivative of 2x cubed is 6x squared, 2 times 3 is 6, plus 2 minus 0. Okay, and now we could clean that up a little bit. I'm going to leave, uh, leave this like that for, for this example, but that's how the chain rule works. We want to find that outer and inner of, the, uh, nest of our nested functions. Scroll up a little bit more and we'll do this other one. All right, and how we can use our chain rule here. Normally, to, to take this derivative, you would want to write it, um, or you would want to take the derivative using the uh, quotient rule, right? Quotient rule. We have a fraction, so I need to use a quotient rule. Well, you can avoid it sometimes if you're careful. All right, so if I write this h of x a little bit differently, I can get, get away with not using the quotient rule. I'm going to take this 3x squared plus 1 to the second power and bring it up out of the denominator. But if I want to bring it up out of the denominator, I need to use a negative exponent. And so this is something that you can use, especially when your numerator is 1, or really any constant. It'll make that problem much easier, but if it's 1 especially, it, it really um, helps to simplify the process. So I bring my denominator up with a negative exponent, and now I can take my derivative, h prime, the derivative of the outer function, right? I have something raised to the negative 2 power. Negative 2 comes down. My something say, stays the same. And now I am taking the derivative. So we ne do negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 6x. 3 times 2 is 6x to the first power. Okay, I am going to clean this one up a little bit. Since that um, 3x squared plus 1 was in the denominator, for my answer, I'm going to drop it back down to the denominator. But now I can see it's raised to the third power. And all the stuff that's left, negative 2 times 6x is negative 12x. Okay, good. This next example, I want to use the alternative um, notation for the chain rule. And our text refers to it as Leibniz's notation. Um, I don't typically, but that's that's how they do. You know, he's one of the one of the mathematicians that developed all of the calculus, m much of the calculus that we still do today. Okay, and so it's this dy over dx equals dy over du times du over dx. Right, and the reason I like this one is because you really focus on um, those nested inner and outer functions, and then um, separating them. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, all right, my outer function for my nested function is that tangent. So I'm just going to write this as y is equal to the tangent of u. So I'm, I'm just taking everything inside of the parentheses and calling it u. And then u is equal to that, that trinomial, 4x squared minus 3x plus 1. 
Okay, so this is more breaking it up into pieces that if you have trouble doing everything all at once, it's too much to keep track of. Well, this now we, we zero in on each individual piece. Okay, and I'm going to take the derivative of each of these functions now on their own. So for my y, dy over du, the derivative of y with respect to u, is equal to secant squared u. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. And then for my u, du over dx is equal to 8x minus 3. The derivative of u with respect to x is 8x minus 3. So then for my derivative of the function, dy over dx is dy over du times du over dx. We put those two pieces together, secant squared u times 8x minus 3. But you do have one additional piece here. We're going to back substitute. We don't want to leave u's and x's in our answer. So this is secant squared of 4x squared minus 3x plus 1 times 8x minus 3. And there's my done finished answer. All right, so the rest of the video, we'll just get a whole bunch more examples, hopefully to get you comfortable with using the chain rule. The key is going to be identifying, identifying inner and outer functions. For this next problem, h of x sine cubed x, one suggestion when taking a derivative of like a trig function, when you have that exponent already, write it in this form, sine of x to the third power. It, seeing it that way helps me to see the inner and outer functions so much more clearly. Here I have something to the third power. So when I take my derivative, exponent comes down, the parentheses stays the same, to the second power, times the derivative of the inside, cosine x. I'm going to write rewrite that one more time and just go back to the notation that I started with sine squared x, cosine x. And that's my final answer for that example. Here's another one. This one isn't cosine raised to a power. Here, the inner function is the 5x squared. The cosine is the outer function. The, the, the 5x squared is the inner function. So when we take our derivative, the first thing that we take the derivative of is cosine. So we have negative sine parentheses, 5x squared, times the derivative of 5x squared, which is 10x. So if again, if you're, if you're struggling with seeing some of these, my outer function is cosine. Uh, this is just like my scratch work that I'm looking at off to the side. I'm not even, it's cosine of something. And my inner function is the 5x squared. Again, if it helps to write that with um, these problems, then go ahead and do that. Or, but that, that should be its own like separate conscious step. Sometimes math problems are really mean, and they force you to use lots of different rules lots of times. All right, so take a look at this one. What's going on? I have parentheses to a power times parentheses to a power. So we have product rule, and while using the product rule, when I have that parentheses to the fifth power, I have to also use the chain rule to differentiate that, all right? So first we'll start out dealing with the product rule. H prime of x is equal to, product rule, we're gonna take f prime times g, five comes down, two x plus one to the fourth power times the derivative of the inside, which is two. So I just used the chain rule on the 2x plus 1 to the 5th power. Then that gets multiplied by g, so times 3x minus 2 to the 7th. You know what, I didn't write it down, but maybe I should have. This is f prime, all of that stuff, times g, and then we're going to say plus g prime times f, and g prime is going to be a little bit big also. All right, so what's our next move here? Plus g prime, the derivative of g, 7 comes down, parentheses stays the same, to the 6th power, times the derivative of the inside, just 3, 
and then that gets multiplied by the original regular f, 2x plus 1 to the fifth. Wow, that was a lot. That looks really messy. Let's clean it up. h prime. Uh, let's see, to simplify this, I've got a 5 there, I've got a 2 there, that usually makes 10 when I'm multiplying. 2x plus 1 to the fourth, 3x minus 2 to the seventh. 7 times 3 is 21. 3x minus 2 to the sixth power. 2x plus 1 to the fifth power. That's real good work. This is a this is a kind of complicated process, but if you want to get like super fancy with this stuff, ready? Watch this next step. H prime of x. Um, I if you get this far, I'm I'm pretty happy. Um, but if you want to do some some really cool stuff, uh, notice here, I have two x plus one to the fourth power, and over here I have two x plus one to the fifth power. So I'm gonna like super factor that two x plus one. That's not really a thing. I'm just saying that. I'm gonna take that two x plus one to the fourth power out of both parts of that expression. And then I'm going to take 3x minus 2. I've got 6 in common to the sixth power. So I'm taking that out of the expression. Big bracket. I'm left with a 10. And I'm left with a 3x minus 2 plus 21 and what's left there is the 2x plus 1. Close that giant bracket. And then what's inside of the giant brackets can simplify further. So if I've lost you, lost you just skip forward in the video until I uh, move on to the next example. But this it's, it's kind of cool how this can all really simplify. Um, I'm almost done. h prime of x. One more step of simplifying. 2x plus 1 to the fourth power. 3x minus 2 to the sixth power. I just really love this stuff. Inside of that big bracket, I have 30x minus 20 plus 42x plus 21. So I'm pushing all that together. So my last parentheses is 72x plus 1. And that is the final answer. Pretty cool. Um, if you can get to this point right there, pat yourself on the back. If you can get to this point right there, you should probably just be teaching this class. <laughs> now, finally, when we nest and have composite functions, um, you can have multiple levels of, of nestedness. Um, so if I have h of f of g of x, notice there's three layers to the, to the nesting. When we take our derivative of that function, h prime, the derivative of the outside, keep everything else the same, times f prime, the derivative of the middle, and then keep everything else the same, times g prime, the derivative of the innermost function. So when you have multiple layers, you can have like five layers of nested or, or composite functions. But with our example, we'll, we're just going to work with three here. Okay, so here's our function, k of x equals cosine to the fourth power of 7x squared plus 1. So when I write this down, and you might not initially see all of the layers, but let's write this down a little bit differently. I'm going to go parentheses, cosine, 7x squared plus 1, raised to the fourth power. When I write it like that, it becomes clearer that I have three layers. The outermost function is something to the fourth power. Then in the middle, I have cosine of a thing. Then on the very inside is 7x squared plus 1. So when we take our derivative, k prime, of x, we start with the outside. 4 comes down. Everything inside stays the same. To the third power. Then differentiate the middle function. The derivative of cosine is negative sine keep the inside the same. Oops. One. Close that parentheses. Close that parentheses. Then multiply by the derivative of all the way inside. 7x squared plus 1 is 14x to the first power plus 0. All right.
And that was pretty cool. So, and, and again, I could nest even more layers and make it more complicated, but also it, it, it helps, again, to, to focus on is this the outside, is this the middle, or is this the inner function? And every time you're taking the derivative uh, of something, what's inside the parentheses after it stays the same. So cleaning this up, k prime of x is equal to, I'm going to multiply 4 and 14 and get, uh, what am I getting there, 56. And then the x, I'm going to write my cosine like this, cosine cubed, 7x squared plus 1. And then um, times my negative sign, um, I guess I'll pull that negative all the way to the front. I should have written that first. So it's the whole thing is negative. And then sine 7x squared plus 1. And there's my final answer on that one. Some of these are a little bit more complicated, but you know, as you work through the homework assignment, you're going to run into tough ones. Um, just reach out to me, and I can give you a hand figuring out you know, what you're supposed to do to take those derivatives. All right, that is the end of this video. Try some of the homework problems. Let me know when you run into questions, and thank you very much for listening. Have a wonderful day.